This is Elevate's Climate Changemakers, highlighting leaders in equity work and climate action. This season, we're having conversations with creators who are centering climate and environmental justice in their art. Let's dive in and meet today's changemaker. Welcome to the Elevate Cafe and this final episode in the third season of Climate Changemakers. I'm Ann Evans, CEO at Elevate. And I'm Amrit Such, Communications Associate here at Elevate. For season three of Climate Changemakers, we're highlighting artists creating content about the climate crisis, inviting in an audience who wouldn't normally be part of the conversation. And today, I am so excited to introduce you all to Kate Levy. She's a filmmaker. She's based in Detroit and New York City at the same time, which is amazing. She's done really important, powerful work on water, immigration rights, and other social justice issues. Welcome, Kate. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. We are so excited about this conversation as well. Cool. So we like to start off here by asking you, how is the world treating you? Um, Relatively speaking, well, um, I think we always have things that are going really great. Um, you know, like I just got married to my wonderful wife, uh, Earl Satter, who's a Chicago native, actually, um, and uh, had some really great opportunities. I have a installation up at the University of Michigan Museum of Art about uh, Enbridge Line Five, um, the oil pipeline, and finishing up this film, Who's Water, um, it, starting on the distribution and um, really so happy to be done with that, well, almost done with that five-year, going on six-year project. Um, and yeah, so, um, but in terms of, you know, you're always, I, I'm always acutely aware of what's happening in the world and I'm always interested in what it means to be in the moment that's like, perfectly pleasant and utterly catastrophic at the same time. So That's really interestingly put. <laughs> so could you tell us a little bit more about your documentary, Who's Water? The National Coalition for Education and Legislation on Affordable Water is um, a project of the People's Water Board, um, which uh, is in Detroit, but um, works with uh grassroots organizers all over the country who are fighting for safe, affordable water and sanitation. Um, and the, um, the National Coalition, NCELA Water's uh, role is to work with people across the country to craft national human right to water legislation, um, which is something that um, even though it's a UN mandate, we don't have that. And so originally, um, I was approached by an attorney named Alice Jennings, um, who uh, has spent decades working on civil rights, environmental justice lawsuits, and she sued the city of Detroit um, for um, shutting off hundreds of thousands of people's water, threatening yeah. to shut off hundreds of thousands of people's water. Um, and when that case was thrown out. She started working on this legislation um, with, with others. Rashida Tlaib was part of it um, and is still part of it. Um, just different groups across the country. Um, so um, so Alice asked me um, to write a grant to do some storytelling around the need for this across the U.S., um, this legislation. And so we got the grant and it kind of turned into this um, this massive project because we realized this was happening all over the country. I didn't necessarily want to go to five places. I thought that it'd be better to go to three, but so many people wanted, you know, when we were doing this outreach to different, different community organizations across the country, they all like really wanted to be part of it. So we kind of, we sort of did that that activist thing where we want to include everyone. And, That's great. <laughs> yeah. Um, and we wanted to bring um, different grassroots filmmakers into the process and fund them to, to create segments for this larger film. But there wasn't really the capacity for that in all of these places, which was really disappointing um, because, you know, it, we need more capacity for grassroots journalism across the country. So it turned into me going to these places and 
I think that was useful because, you know, I was able to make relationships with people as a filmmaker and bring them more into the work of the coalition. So that so that worked out. But it also ended up being that, you know, people were starting to get more and more press about not having access to water. Flint really opened the floodgates on that. And there are communities that have been struggling with this for 20, 30 years that never got the media attention they um they need it. And something about Flint just hit people. Um, I mean, even more than the DC water crisis with lead was found in water, like Flint hit. And so then all these other communities were like, well, we were before Flint. And one of the things that you see are these short five minute pieces, like, you know, and no, no shade on, on like vice or, you know, any other, you know, progressive, you know, media outlet. And some of, some of these pieces are really good. Um, but they are really focused on like, this is what it looks like to have access, to not have access to water or sanitation. Look how horrible this is. And here's some activism. But what I was really interested in, um, in, in conjunction with creating national legislation was informing people about, you know, about the reasons why we need specific solutions. So I was really interested in the historical context. I was really interested in the relationship between government and industry. Um, and I was really interested in the relationship between um, access to democratic power and um, and resources that come along with access to democratic power and access to water. So this is, for a while I was saying this film is about, is, is about everything but water. Um, and water is sort of just the, the, um, the end result. So, so that's really, I think what the film does differently. And uh, we visited five places. We, I had already been working on Detroit and Flint um, and Michigan in general since 2014. So, um, so a lot of that footage is in, not a lot of, but some of that footage is in the film. Um, And then we visited um, Lowndes County, Alabama, looked at um, um, the issues with and people are familiar with this now, um, on-site sanitation systems, the cost of the on-site sanitation systems. Um, and, um, you know, the narrative is about having hookworm, there's hookworm, or there was hookworm because of lack of access to sanitation. But I think it's important to tie it back to the way that states allocate resources for upgrades. Um, Navajo Nation, we looked at the legacies of uranium mining and coal mining and how that's impacting, um, you know, the the tribe today and thought about what it meant to, you know, the relationship with the federal government. Um, Martin County, uh, Kentucky, Appalachia, coal, but also the connection between you know, what happens when a rural community tries to build infrastructure and, and within an extractive industrial context. Um, and then uh, Des Moines, Iowa, where the city sued uh, large farms or mm-hmm. the counties of the large farms. Um, they have a, a drainage system under the soil that's run by the counties. And so the city water department sued the counties for excess um, nitrate um, nitrates in the in their source water which ended up um they they lost the lawsuit um but their goal was to get this farm runoff that is completely unregulated regulated by the clean water act so um and then philadelphia as sort of looking at uh their implementation of a water affordability program but uh, so i'll just say one other thing that you know we started out thinking about water affordability but you know, even if you implement a a water affordability mandate, there are so many other underlying issues that make water unaffordable. Mm -hmm. Um, And part of it is the political will, but about, you know, caring about the lives of poor, um, often people of color, but but as much of an issue as, you know, given an excuse not to care when you have so many other burdens of treating water on your back, if that makes sense. So, Kate, what really dri- has driven you to work on environmental issues? So, I think that there are a few things that make me furious that I'm enraged by, and um, and and they're all issues. You know, whether it's healthcare or whether it's it's treating 
the elderly as though they're disposable or whether it's, um, you know, gentrification, um, I think, you know, or environmental justice, I think arrogance is like, is, is sort of rooted in all that, the arrogance of patriarchy to, to be able to make decisions for Mm -hmm. everybody. Mm -hmm. Um, and that, um, that just strikes a chord with me. So for me, environmental justice is, it's obviously one of, you know, one of the most pressing issues, if not the most pressing issue. And it is connected to so many other issues. Um, you know, I mean, you can connect it to, you can connect it to gentrification. Um, when you, when you think about, um, you know, the, where people are, you know, where people are being pushed to, or what types of production drive, um, where people live, um, you can, you know, you can connect it to, um, you know, I cannot, you can connect it to racism. To, so I, I'm, I'm very interested in how it connects to different elements of our world. Um, you know, and I, and, and simultaneously, I'm very, um, I'm, I'm just very concerned about the earth. Um, my mom, uh, you know, is a, is, you know, she's not a political, but she's, you know, she, she's a conservationist. She, you know, she, she loves the natural world. I think I got that from her. Um, and so I guess I don't see the work that I do as falling squarely in line with environmental justice so much as, as just justice in general, um, because yeah. of all the ways that environmental justice is, um, is connected yeah. to mm-hmm. all of these other issues. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, I think how I got involved in it, um, was really, um, I mean, I grew up around the Great Lakes and I traveled to Kenya, um, right after I finished grad school and I, um, I had, I had a friend who brought her students to work with Maasai land rights activists. Um, and, um, and I really wanted to see what, um, what that looked like to bring to bring students from the U.S. to collaborate with Maasai land rights activists and have very few cultural reference points, but to be able to collaborate um, in a way that was rather non hierarchical, and what it meant to give resources as you know coming from a more resource place and share resources and build power. And so, but that fight that they were working on was an environmental justice fight. Um, you know, it was about getting access to their ancestral land. It was an indigenous rights fight and it was an economic justice fight. Um, their, their economy is, you know, is, um, it's based, the Maasai's economy, it's based in, in tourism. Um, and obviously conservation is important, to, uh, to that, but it's also, you know, it's also based in cyclic uses of land and the land had been, um, you know, devastated by industrial agriculture, all the while the Maasai community was blamed and their land was taken because they were, the narrative was that they were unable to take care of the land. So Mm -hmm. I think, I think that there is like, like all the things that I'm interested in, I'm interested in the ways that narratives can disenfranchise or empower people. And I think that narratives around, um, environmental justice are are often racist narratives. So envi- saving the environment is uh, often carries uh, underlying racism within it. You know, the Maasai were, were disenfranchised because, you know, conservationists, Western conservationists said they were overgrazing the land, which, which was not true. Um, and so, um, So, you know, and the same is true, you know, you blame a community that's been subjected to horrific, you know, amounts of air pollution or water pollution for their diet, you know. Um, So, so I think for me, it's a really important way to get at, um, get at these narratives. It's another way to get at these narratives. And it's also, you know, it's, um, you know, it's the work that we have to do right now. Okay, what do you anticipate the impact of your film to be? So Whose Water is, um, it's, a, it's a rigorous piece. Um, it, it, the research 
took much longer than the filming as it <laughs> tends, I mean, it tends to, um, the editing took, you know, as long as the research, you know, it, um, there's a lot of historical context. There's a lot of elucidating the way that different agencies work in conjunction with each other. Um, it's not, it's, it's, it's investigative. It's, I like to think it's really engaging because of the stories that it tells, but it's, it's, um, it's something that I want, um, that I want the people who are going to be in politics, who are going to be public servants, who are going to be business people, who are going to, you know, be consuming and writing narratives about the world. I want them to, um, I want them to learn about this. Um, so I, I think for me, I want, I want a lot of students to see it. I want academics who are writing about this to see it. Um, I want the public to see it. Um, because I, I hope that it will inform people about how to get involved in governmental processes. How I, I want it, you know, I want people to see the many different um, uh, methods of organizers that we try to feature. You know, it's not just protests, it's, it's litigation, it's writing legislation, it's direct action. It's, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, there are so many different ways that people organize and there are so many different tensions within that organizing. Um, and so I want, I want it to be useful for, for organizers and for people who are learning about organizing as well. That's great. That's really great. You know, when I saw the trailer, I was really um, hit by both the strength and resilience of some of the some of the people, some of the leaders uh, uh, telling their stories in, in, in the film. I can't wait to see it. Can you tell me what's one of those stories that really hit home for you? Ooh. Oh, boy. Well, first of all, I, I, I do, I do want to, you know, respond to what you said about the uh, strength and resilience. I think that we, you know, and, and, uh, and most filmmakers will, will say the same thing, that we don't have enough stories of people fighting back um and it's my goal to to not to not gloss over the the you know the problem but also you know give space to show people fighting back um i think in all like the most inspired i'll tell you just sort of like blanket the most inspiring to me is when people are like like walking textbooks and also still fighting the fight and also dealing with the direct physical ramifications. So um, in Detroit, I'll talk about, so Nicole Hill, a dear friend and also activist, um, she had her, she had her water shut off for eight weeks. Children, um, I don't go into like the whole story in the film, um, but you know, she, Put her kids in another in another place because she didn't want her kids taken away if, yeah. if somebody saw the water shut off. So her daughter wanted to come home and she walked down the street at two o'clock in the morning and the cops brought her home. Um, uh, Kehlani, she's now sixteen. She was probably seven or eight at the time. Um, and uh, but Nicole is this. She is just. just She's this avid Prince fan. She was not involved in the water movement at all until this happened. And she's just like, there's something about people who are not lifelong activism, who, activists who weren't raised in activism, um, you know, coming to the space and taking up leadership because it, it, it hits home, um, you know, and in Des Moines, you know, the, the courage of the water department to sue big agriculture. And, you know, this, so this guy, Bill Stowe, he also died. He died of cancer. He, um, he was the director of the Des Moines Water Works. And he was just, as a public figure, I mean, he, <laughs> he was, you know, he, I'm sure he, after the end of the smear campaign from big agriculture, understood what it was like to be a black politician yeah. um, because of how much they drug him through the mud and called him corrupt and called, you know. And so I think I think the thing is, when you're an activist, you're you're called a you you're immediately labeled a pariah. Um, and when um, a uh, 
and it's it's very 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 hard to uh, you know it's popular it's sexy to be an activist but it's like not yeah fun <laughs> or easy hard work yeah it's it, like people have their lives destroyed and yeah. lose all their friends and you know we don't realize that um, is well, that Kate, helpful yeah Kate your work is really really inspirational thank you for everything that you do can you tell us what inspires you I think the thing that inspires me um, now is um, so growing up, I, you know, I grew up in an environment where um, many of us did. Um, I grew up in the suburbs. I grew up, um, you know, in the 80s, 90s. Um, there wasn't a lot of sense of activism. There wasn't, a, there was this, there was a, you know, if I wanted to make a difference in the world, I had to be a self starter. I had to go out and do it. I had to, you know, I had to follow my dream. I had to be, you know, sort of singular. And I think becoming um, closer and, and entering into activist communities, I've learned what it means to build power. And I think building power is, you know, is not a singular act. And it's incredibly inspiring to me to see people, you know, working together to, to build the collective up. Um, but that, and I think the other thing that inspires me is history. Um, not in like, oh, look at our ancestors did all this great stuff, although they did. But I think I'm driven to make my work because of history. Um, I think that when, when oppressive systems um, function um, and do the most harm is, um, is when they are able to erase history. Mm -hmm. I think when you erase history, you you erase, you know, movements that have come before you, you make people feel ungrounded. So I think it's really important. And it's important to me and my work to highlight history. Thank you, Kate. Your work is really inspirational. I can't wait to see your film. Where can we learn more about your work? Um, well, you can visit my website. Um, I'm a little busy to update it, but <laughs> it's katelevydocumentary.com um, and you can contact me. Um, and if you want to see the film, um, you can arrange a screening. We're still, we're doing private screenings with groups of up to a hundred. So if you want to host a screening, um, the best way would be to go to my website and send me an email and I will hook you up. We will do that. Mm -hmm. Yes, Kate, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you for listening. Be sure to check out our other episodes of Climate Change Makers. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Climate Change Makers. And thank you to all the climate change makers for your work, for your inspiration, for your conversation, and for all the work you will do in the future. Thank you. <laughs>